Hello, it's Mark from Castings for Ancient Greece here. Before we begin today's episode, I just want to give a quick podcast recommendation. But I'll turn it over to Philip from the History of European Theatre podcast to tell you more. The story of theatre in Europe starts with the Greeks and their love of a great story told and retold in many ways. They give us the core elements of theatre that we still see today. Theatre that spoke to them about their society and that now gives us a window into their world. Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides are just the start of a long journey through the fascinating story of the development of dramatic art and culture in Europe. If you'd like to know how theatre developed through the ages, please join me, Philip Rowe, at the History of European Theatre podcast, where I'm tracing the history of three millennia of theatre, from the ancient Greeks to the modern day. We'll be talking about theatre in every sense of the word, the way it's created and presented, the people who make it happen, the places it happens in, and so much more. We'll look at the way it reflects and interacts with the society it was written for, and how the ideas contained in it can get carried forward, preserved and reinterpreted to and for future times, including our own. So if you like theatre and history, and you want to know more about the way it has developed, how it worked in the past, and what it means then and now, you can find the History of European Theatre podcast on Apple Podcasts and all good podcast apps, Spotify, Amazon Music and YouTube. Please come and join us there. In the spring of 480 BC, Xerxes led the Persian army in its second campaign on Greece. Not long after leaving the city of Sardis, an eclipse of the sun took place. To where the Magi were on hand to put the great king's mind at ease. Herodotus retells the story. No sooner had the troops begun to move than the sun vanished from his place in the sky and it grew dark as night. Though the weather was perfectly clear and cloudless, Xerxes, deeply troubled, asked the Magi to interpret the significance of this strange phenomenon. And it was given to understand that God meant to foretell the Greeks the eclipse of their cities. For it was the sun which gave warning of the future to Greece, just as the moon did to Persia. Having heard this, Xerxes continued the march in high spirits. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck, and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 18, The Second Persian Invasion. The Athenians, with assistance from their Plataean allies, had fought off the Persian threat, and in their minds, they had saved all of Hellas from Persian subjugation. Sparta, recognised as having the most effective army, had sent help, but in fulfilling their religious obligations during the festival of the Carnea, they would arrive too late to take part in the battle. The Athenians now had reached a point in their collective consciousness of becoming a military power in their own right, with the victory at Marathon Bay playing an important role in the Athenian psyche for generations. To honour their dead, the Athenians did something that had not been done for hundreds of years. They buried them on the field of battle, it was customary for a dead hoplite to be returned to his family, who would then have him buried in a family plot outside the city. After Marathon, though, a mound with a tomb inside was built to house the fallen hoplites on the plains which still stands today. In the late 1800s, the tomb was excavated, which showed animal sacrifices had been made to all the gods responsible for the Athenian victory, which were placed in a trench. Above this sacrificial trench was a larger one where all the cremated remains of the hoplites were buried. Also found was an urn with the remains of an individual, perhaps that of the fallen Callimachus. Though not to forget the Plataeans, a smaller mound was constructed nearby which housed the eleven of their fallen hoplites. With this newfound confidence after Marathon, the power of the people further increased while that of the nobles was further diluted. Three years after Marathon, the Archon ships would now be selected by lot from a pool of 500 that had been elected by the deems in much the same manner as how members of the boule were chosen. An anti-Persian sentiment also grew within Athens, with anyone holding sympathies or benefiting from them would pay politically for their connections. It wouldn't be only these men that would suffer, but with the increase in democratic institutions, the people were much more suspicious of powerful men in political life and their motives, and now they were more likely to act against such would-be tyrants. One of the first men that the Athenians would become suspicious of after the Battle of Marathon was that of Miltiades. With the Battle of Marathon won, his reputation had soared. Out of the surviving generals, he had contributed the most for the victorious outcome over the Persians. With his reputation at such heights, 
he requested the use of a fleet of 70 ships as well as troops and money. He was preparing to mount an expedition against the island of Paros, just west of Naxos, which he claimed had aided the Persians in their landing at Marathon. Though it appears, or has been reported by sources friendly to Paros, that Miltiades had a personal grievance with the island, as his name had been slandered to the Persians there. Whatever the true reason, Miltiades' reputation and his promise of riches to the Athenians saw them grant his requests without raising any objections. Miltiades embarked on his expedition, arriving at the island of Paros with his fleet, where he demanded the Parians pay 100 talents, or he would blockade the island until the city fell. One talent was roughly what a 200-man crew of a trireme was paid between them for one month's work. The Parians had no intention ceding to Miltiades' demands, and they began setting up an effective defence to counter any attempt to take the city, and a siege now ensured. After 26 days of the siege, very little progress had been made, and it was at this stage that Miltiades was injured, presumably through some sort of action against the Parians' defence. Though the Parians had reported to Herodotus that a form of divine intervention took place when Miltiades fell, injuring himself trying to enter a shrine where terror had overcome him. With Miltiades returning to Athens injured, and the siege making no headway, the Athenians saw that the promise of riches was not going to be fulfilled. It was now at this point that they decided to make their objections to the expedition known. Miltiades was brought before the Athenians on the charge of defrauding the public. By this stage, his injuries had become gangrenous, and he was unable to present his own defence. His friends would mount a defence for him where they pointed out his past services to the city, and if it were not for him, they would be ruled by the Persians now. The Athenians decided to spare Miltiades' life, but instead passed down a fine of 50 talents to be paid. Not long after the hearing, the hero of Marathon, Miltiades, succumbed to his injuries. His fine would be passed on to his son, Cimon, who would also become a leading figure in Athenian public life. It was normal practice for debts to be inherited by family members once the holder of the debt passed away. This opening round of the Greco-Persian Wars would see the further evolution of the Greek city-states. They would be responding to the threats presented by the Persian Empire, while also contending with the diplomatic complexities that came with the many city-states that dotted the Greek mainland and islands. Policies and public figures would emerge that would forever shape their futures, especially that of Athens. In this decade, the tool of ostracism would be used for the first time in Athens, even though being written into the Athenian constitution during Chrysostom's time. Today we still use the word to describe someone being socially shunned. Though the name of this mechanism came from the broken pottery shard that voters would scratch the name of their chosen candidate on, known as an ostraca. The mechanism was designed to help prevent the rise of tyrants by giving the citizens the opportunity to vote and send into exile a public figure that they feared was sending Athens back down the road to tyranny. Though as time went on, it seems to have helped decide between polarising policies, setting the direction Athens would take. Once a year, it would be decided on if an ostracism would be held. If so, the person receiving the most votes would be sent in exile from Athens for 10 years. The first time we know of ostracism being used was in 487 BC, and the last recorded use was in 417 BC. During this time, it's thought 12 men were ostracised, with five taking place in the 480s. A new public figure to emerge in the historical record during this period would be embroiled in a number of ostracisms conducted. With the death of Miltiades, a vacuum had been created, but there was one man who had been operating in the background for years. He would now step forward and would become one of the most influential public figures in Athenian politics for the next decade. His name was Themistocles. His father had tried to dissuade him from seeking a role in public life when Plutarch relates a story in his work, The Life of Themistocles. To deter him from public business and to let him see how the vulgar behave themselves towards their leaders, when they have at last no further use for them, his father showed him the old galleys as they lay forsaken and cast upon the seashore. Just before the Battle of Marathon, Themistocles had held the position of eponymous archon, the most senior of the archon positions, as you may remember from our earlier episodes on Athens. At this point, he would have been in his early 30s, and just a few years later, he had fought at the Battle of Marathon. In his early life, Themistocles recognised the importance of Athens controlling the seas, and he had taken steps in fortifying a new port for Athens, which would see the Piraeus becoming the new official port being able to support a much larger navy. 
Themistocles' rise in political life saw him support and appeal to the lower classes of Athens, which led him to be seen as a radical amongst the nobility. This would see factions form again based on class. Themistocles had the popular support, but the nobility rallied around a man named Aristides, who his followers called the Just. Both Herodotus and the philosopher Plato present him as an honourable man. A great rivalry would develop between the two, with the characters of the two having been described as polar opposites. Plutarch in his life on Themistocles begins by describing him as quick, reckless, unscrupulous, and easily born with haste into any undertaking while Aristides was founded upon a firmer character, which was intent on justice and not inclined towards any falsehood, buffoonery, or trick even in a game. A large part of Themistocles' policies revolved around building wealth and security for Athens in the form of naval power, while Aristides, with the support of the upper classes, who many would have been a part of the hot white class, opposed such policies relating to the navy. It would have been seen that building a large navy would require the employment of many oarsmen, who would come from the lower classes. This lower class would become integral to the security of Athens and would ultimately receive more political power. The rivalry came to a head between Themistocles and Aristides when a lucrative seam of silver was discovered in the Athenian mines at Laurion, in southern Attica. Aristides presented a proposal for the windfall to be split between all citizens of Athens. Themistocles, on the other hand, had suggested the money should be put towards building a new fleet. Themistocles' arguments for his case carried the day, though the tensions between the two camps increased over the coming months. The ostracism of 482 BC would come down to a direct showdown between Aristides and Themistocles. Plutarch tells a story involving the ostracism where an illiterate man approached Aristides during the casting of the votes. Not recognising him, he asked if Aristides could write down his vote for him. Aristides asked who he wished to vote for, to where the man replied, Aristides. Aristides asked out of interest why he voted the way he did, where he replied he was sick of hearing Aristides being called the just all the time. Aristides, living up to his name, cast the vote as the illiterate man wished. Once the votes had been calculated, Aristides had received an overwhelming majority, meaning he would be exiled and Themistocles' policy had been ratified. Themistocles would go on to dominate Athenian politics for the next few years, though Aristides would make a return. As politics was continuing in Athens after the first Persian invasion, so too were developments in the Persian court. The failure at Marathon was far from a disaster for the Persians, but would have been a point of frustration for Darius, and according to Herodotus, he was furious at the setback. He had all intentions on returning to Greece with a larger force, but that campaign would have to wait, as other matters within the empire required attention first. In the west, a far richer region, and one already part of the empire, had revolted. Egypt had gone into revolt and needed to be brought back under control before a renewed campaign against Greece could be thought of. The details of the revolt are not known, but it would not be Darius to stamp it out, but his successor. The details are not known for sure, but it is thought that Darius died of an illness in 486 BC. Darius had three sons, and the one that had been selected to succeed him was Xerxes, although not the eldest of all his sons. He was the eldest child resulting from Darius' marriage to Atossa the daughter of Cyrus the Great. With these connections, Xerxes would be able to point to a stronger legitimacy to the throne. He was the son of Darius, but also had a direct bloodline to the founder of the empire, Cyrus the Great. It's interesting to note that from Xerxes onwards, all the kings of Persia would have to trace a direct bloodline to Cyrus to be able to come to the throne. It appears that Darius was the only one with a loose or dubious connection to Cyrus. So with a revolt underway in the empire, Xerxes was able to begin his reign with an opportunity to demonstrate his power militarily as he would lead the campaign that would crush it. After Egypt had been brought back under control, another revolt would break out, this time at Babylon, a city of great importance to the empire. This revolt broke out after Xerxes' accession to the throne and appears to have been triggered due to this accession taking place. Though, with most revolts, discontent would have been present for some time. All that was needed was the right time and opportunity to make a move. Throughout history, when a transition of power occurs in a kingdom or an empire, it is often seen as a time of weakness and as a great opportunity to challenge the new order. Xerxes, though, with the experience of having just dealt with the Egyptian revolt and having been prepared for his role to rule the empire, would prove to be far from a weak leader. The revolt of Babylon was thought to have broken out in 494 BC, 
and it is even thought that a second revolt may have followed, as 479 BC has also been seen as another date where the region needed some attention. In any event, Xerxes was able to stabilise the region, eliminating the internal threats to his rule for now. Herodotus also tells us a story about Xerxes' visit to Babylon, presumably during the revolt, which would prove to explain some misfortunes later on. Remembering Herodotus was writing with the benefit of hindsight. He tells us that Xerxes removed an 18 foot high gold statue of Zeus from the temple, which apparently his father Darius had designs on but did not dare remove. In the process of Xerxes having the statue removed, a priest was killed in attempting to prevent the sacrilege. Again, we are not sure how accurate the story is, but it would prove to be a convenient reason for explaining future events in Xerxes' life. One aspect we have seen that seems to remain a common practice of the Persian king since Cyrus was the tolerance of peoples within the empire to practice their own religion and traditions. Though, during Xerxes' reign, this notion has been questioned, mainly due to an inscription known as the Davia inscription at Persepolis, where Xerxes reinforces the worship of Ahura Mazda, like those before him, but he also talks of punishment being inflicted on those who worship false gods. But when it comes to tangible evidence throughout the empire, there doesn't appear to be anything to show that a policy change had occurred when it came to religious observance in the regions. It seems the inscription was Xerxes' official word, like his predecessors, inserting his right to rule and invoking the official Iranian god. A more pragmatic approach throughout the empire seems to have continued to be observed. So, thus ended the reign of Darius I, who ruled the empire for 36 years, and it was now Xerxes who sat on the Persian throne. It was now his responsibility to see to it that Athens and Greece were not forgotten, and that revenge still needed to be obtained against Athens for their past injustices against the empire. Herodotus tells us that it was Mardonius, a general who had served under Darius in the campaign north of Greece, as well as an entourage of others that had put Xerxes' focus back onto Greece, as if he had lost sight of his father's vision. Though, one would think that Xerxes didn't need others to remind him as the policy of expanding the empire had been at the forefront of every Persian ruler so far, while Darius had already laid much of the groundwork for the expansion westward. Once Egypt and Babylon had been dealt with, the preparations for the invasion of Greece would take another four years before it was ready to be launched. During this time, troops from all parts of the empire had to be assembled, with many cultural and language groups making up the army. Supply dumps for the army had to be set up along the path chosen for the advance that would take place from Sardis heading north over the Hellespont, through Thrace, Macedonia, and then into Greece. Engineering projects would also need to be undertaken along the route and completed before the army and navy arrived. With two of the major projects at the Hellespont and at the peninsula where Mount Athos is located. A large part of the groundwork in securing a relatively safe path north of Greece had been undertaken during Darius's campaigns during the first invasion. Now though, Persian heralds would have been sent ahead attempting to secure yet more tokens of submission in the face of the Persian forces, with many Greek city-states in the north of Greece engaging in the practice coined by the Greeks of Medizing. This time around, two Greek city-states that heralds were not sent to on purpose were that of Athens and Sparta. The last time the Persians had sought earth and water from them before the Marathon campaign, the Persian heralds were thrown into a pit in Athens, like common criminals and pushed down a well in Sparta, where they were told to collect their own earth and water down there. Earlier on, and in past episodes, we have mentioned the acts of Medizing in the form of submitting to the Persians' demand for earth and water. Medizing is pretty much aligning one city or cooperating with the Persians, therefore opposed to Greek interests. Remembering the Greeks were not a united political entity, with each city being its own state, but they shared a linguistic and cultural identity. So if the Greek city-states were submitting to the Persians, why was it called Medizing? This is a good question, and it's not known for sure, but I've come across an explanation in Matt Water's book, Ancient Persia, that seems very rational, to going some way to explain the term. If you recall the Persians in establishing their empire, overthrew the Median Empire, of which they were a part of. With the Persian Empire in place, the Medes still had a large population within the empire. During the operations in Ionia, after the conquest of Lydia, Median generals were in command of what is thought to be armies made up of predominantly Median troops. These armies are thought to have left a lasting impression on the Ionian Greeks. As we can see from a passage from Xenophanes, who was an Ionian Greek 
living during the Median and Persian dominations. Such are the things to discuss by the fire in winter, while reclining on a soft couch, well fed, drinking sweet wine, snacking on seeds. Who are you? And from where among men? How many years have passed you by, good man? How old were you when the Mede came? It seems unlikely that the Greeks would have confused the Medes and Persians, as there are many references in ancient works that differentiate between the two. Having said this though, Herodotus uses the term Medes, Persians, and Barbarians on many occasions interchangeably when referring to the Persians. Many of the Greek city-states in the north of Greece would Medize, with the threat of the Persian army looming down upon them. Many would not live down their decision to assist the Persians for generations to come. The city of Thebes would be one of the largest city-states to Medize, and animosity can be detected in ancient works when interactions with Thebes is brought up many years after the Greco-Persian Wars. Though as we'll see later on, the political landscape will also shape opinion on Thebes. Once understanding the enormity of the army approaching unopposed, assisting the Persians seemed like the best chance for one city and its citizens to survive the invasions. No one wanted an army that drank rivers dry in their region for too long. The army and navy that Xerxes would lead against Greece was on the scale nothing seen before. If there was any doubt about the first invasion in 490 being one of conquest, then there could be no doubt this time around. The army was drawn from all parts of the empire, and to call it Persian was just simply acknowledging the empire all these cultural groups served. Of course there were Persian and medium troops, but making up the bulk of the army were troops from the modern regions of Pakistan and Afghanistan in the east, Egypt, Arabia and Libya in the south, Babylonians, Assyrians, Phoenicians and Greeks in the west, in the north, people from the Caucasus, the Scythians, and groups from the north of Greece, plus many, many more. Herodotus spends some time going through the many groups, as well as describing the dress they wore. The way Herodotus lists all of Xerxes' forces is in the same vein as what we see in Homer's catalogue of ships in the Iliad. The sense given in Herodotus is that all the resources of the Persian Empire were being called upon for the conquest of Greece. The numbers of troops that he outlines that were involved in the campaign are mind-boggling, and seem to be exaggerated by a great deal. Herodotus gives us a total fighting strength of over 2 million troops, with nearly 2 million being infantry, 80,000 cavalry, 20,000 chariots and camels, and 300,000 Thracians and Greeks allied to Persia. He then doubles this number to account for all the support roles and camp followers that would have been attached to the army. Many historians have pointed out that these figures seem impossibly high, and a couple of explanations have been put forward to show how these figures may have come about. Firstly, the Persian command system was worked out on units of tens, hundreds, thousands, and ten thousands, with a command title for each size. It is thought Herodotus had access to official reports of the figures, but had mixed up the commander's titles for both the units of the thousands and ten thousands. This would then reduce the figure for the fighting force from over 2 million to what seems like a more plausible just over 200,000. Another explanation to why this figure seems so high is because that is what Xerxes wanted the Greeks to believe they were up against. Herodotus does tell us a story of some Greeks who were sent on a spying mission to gain information on the Persian army. These men were captured, but instead of being executed, they were invited into the Persian camps to where they were given a full tour and provide information on the rest of the forces gathering, before then allowing them to return to Greece with what they had learnt. It seems that these spies may have been given a detailed roster of the Persian forces, as Herodotus seems to be working from some official numbers. We are also given figures on the navy that the Persians were to send along with the army, with Herodotus claiming just over 1,200 triremes and 3,000 transport and support ships set sail. The figure given here is not seen as overinflated as the one given for the land forces, though in modern times some have disputed it thinking that the Persians would have only been able to muster half that number. Also suggested is Herodotus may be including the ships that would be used in creating the bridge of ships over the Hellespont that we'll get to soon. On this point though, many other ancient writers have also given numbers of the Persian fleet, with most recording figures of between 1,000 and 1,300 triremes, adding a little bit more weight behind Herodotus' figures, and perhaps why the fleet hasn't attracted the same scrutiny as the land forces. Though, before the forces could march and set sail, the way ahead had to be prepared for them. Years before the campaign had begun, Xerxes had a number of engineering projects underway. The two of the largest taking place at the Hellespont, 
and on the peninsula of Mount Athos. If you recall, when we did the episode about the preparations of Darius's initial force sent to the north of Greece, the fleet was lost in a storm as it rounded Mount Athos. This time around, the fleet would follow the coastline in parallel to the march of the army, and instead of sailing around the notorious Mount Athos Peninsula, Xerxes ordered a canal to be cut through the top of the peninsula, allowing the navy to avoid another potential disaster. The Phoenicians were at the head of this project, as they were recognised as not only excellent sailors, but were known for their engineering abilities. We were told that they were given the centre section of the canal, and cut the sides at angles so as it wouldn't collapse into the water. There doesn't appear to be much cooperation with the different teams constructing the canal. As we hear, the others had not used angles, and had to contend with the banks falling into the canal. The project would take three years, and also required the people in the surrounding areas to be pressed into service for its construction. When it was complete, it was two kilometres long, 30 metres wide, and three metres deep, which would be enough for two triremes to pass each other. Herodotus gives us the most detailed account of the canal, but Thucydides also makes a passing reference to it, showing that it still existed in his time 80 years later. Though in ancient times, and into more modern times, it's thought that the canal never really existed, as the project seemed too far complicated. But in the 1990s, nearly 2,500 years later, Herodotus was vindicated, when a surveying team, after analysing the area, confirmed the canal had existed, as Herodotus described. Though before the canal was reached, the Persian army had to get from Asia and into Europe. So to do this, a bridge would be constructed connecting the two continents over the Hellespont. The project would be completed twice, as after the work was finished the first time, a huge store tore down the original bridges. Xerxes was furious, and took out his rage on the men in charge of the bridge's construction, as well as the Hellespont itself. Orders were sent to behead all of those involved, with new engineers brought in to rebuild. The Hellespont was reportedly given 300 lashes, with a pair of fetters being tossed into the strait, representing its shackling while being told, Xerxes the king will cross you, with or without your permission. The second attempt saw two separate bridges spanning the Hellespont, one for the army to cross and the other for the slower support and baggage trains. The bridges were built as pontoon bridges, with the bridges resting on a foundation of boats lined up at right angles to the shore, parallel to each other and anchors holding them in place. Each of the bridges would have over 300 boats arranged in this manner to where large cables were stretched across and pulled taut. The Phoenicians and Egyptians were tasked with the creation of these extremely long cables, with the Phoenicians constructing theirs out of flax, and the Egyptians using papyrus, with multiple lengths being used in each bridge. Once the cables were in place, planks of wood were laid all the way along, where then brushwood and soil were put down over the top. A screen was also constructed on either side of the walkway, so that the animals that would make the crossing didn't see the rushing water and cause a panic. Herodotus tells us that the bridges, once complete, stretched some 1,300 metres in length. After four years of planning, and with all the engineering projects complete, the path was now set for Xerxes' army and fleet to begin the second invasion of Greece. The city of Sardis acted as a staging area for large parts of the Persian army, who in mid-April of 480 BC would move off north towards the Hellespont, where they would meet up with the rest of the army, at Abydos on the coast. On the march, the Persian army witnessed an eclipse of the sun, and the Magi had put Xerxes' mind at ease, interpreting the event as the foretelling of successful outcome of the campaign. The columns of men heading north were so great that it was a week's march from the rear to the lead formations. Before arriving at the Hellespont, Xerxes took a detour and visited the ancient city of Troy. This appears to have been of a symbolic gesture, framing his campaign as revenge for the West's invasions of the East. And where better to show this than at the most famous site where the Greeks had come ashore and made war on the east. As the forces were assembling at Abydos, they were met with the sight of the two bridges made of hundreds of ships that stretched nearly 1,500 metres across the strait, connecting Asia to Europe. Once Xerxes had arrived, much pomp and ceremony took place with royal reviews and a regatta. Normal ship traffic was still taking place through the straits. The bridges had been constructed with gaps, allowing the straits to still be used. Once the crossing commenced, pre-built sections would be moved into place to fill in the gaps. Among the ship traffic were trading vessels, bringing grain from the Black Sea to Greece. These traders were allowed to continue their voyage, with reasoning being provided in Herodotus' account, where Xerxes' counsellors were waiting for orders to seize the ships. Where are they bound for? Xerxes asked. To Persia's enemies, my lord, came the answer. 
with a cargo of grain. Well, said the king, are we not bound ourselves for the same destination? And does not our equipment include grain amongst other things? I do not see that the men in those ships are doing us any harm in carrying our grain for us. In May, with all the contingents of the army assembled, the crossing of the bridges now took place. As the first formation set foot on the European shore, the campaign now got underway. The Persian fleet around the same time was now departing the coast of Anatolia, where it would meet up with the army as they entered Thrace. From here they would follow the coastline, shadowing the march of the land forces, only separating for a couple of weeks when the fleet sailed through the Athos Canal and around the rest of the peninsulas. The march, once crossing the bridges, would take three months. During that time, the army was supported by the large supply dumps that had been set up during the campaign's preparations, along with the tyrants and city-states that had Medized preparing livestock and flour in anticipation for the Persian army's arrival in their regions. During this time, the Persian army also grew in size, with local levies falling in with the Persians fulfilling their obligations of submission to the great king. The army had marched through Thrace, Macedonia, and now entered Thessaly. It was now August, and the largest invading army the world had yet seen was crossing into Greek territory. We will leave the Persian army crossing into the northern Greek territories. Though, the Greeks had not been quiet during the period that the Persians were assembling their forces and setting into motion the largest invading force yet known. Next episode, we will turn to what the Greeks were doing to prepare to meet and defend their land against Xerxes' vast army and fleet. Could this collection of fiercely independent city-states come together to ward off a common enemy? The fate of Hellas depended on it. Thank you for your continued support. If you have been enjoying the series, please consider leaving a review at iTunes or your favourite podcasting platform. They go a long way into supporting the show. To receive updates and to be notified of new episodes, you can subscribe at www.castingthroughancientgreece.com. Also, you can follow the series on Facebook at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. I hope you can join me next time for episode 19, The Greeks Prepare. <laughs>